Hello, welcome back to the Edge of the Box podcast, a podcast by whoscored.com. We've already done Arsenal and Manchester City, and today I'm here with my good friend Quaiko to preview Chelsea's upcoming season. Quaiko, unusual for us to be previewing a side that, that finished 12th, but we're, we're here doing it. <laughs> Here he goes. He gets it in early. He gets it in oh, early. I like that. <laughs> we all know what happened to Chelsea last season. Um, we all know that it was a huge fall from grace. Different managers, different systems, different ownership in terms of a full season under the, the Clear Lake and, and Bowley regime. And it was a season to forget for Chelsea. But one thing that I do recall is that when Chelsea have a season to forget, mm. usually the next season ends in glory. So hopefully we can uh, can continue that trend uh, in this upcoming season with Pochettino. A man that I'm liking what I'm hearing from um, in press conferences, in interviews. I like what I'm seeing on the sidelines as well. So I'm hopeful as a Chelsea fan, but expectation probably does need to be muted a little bit because we haven't got the business done that we need to get done. Do you not think, I mean, you bought a hell of a lot of players again and a hell of a lot of players have moved out as well, which I think Chelsea really needed to do. And in fairness, I think they've done good business. Both ways, actually, they've, they've done good business. But it is a, it's a very young side, isn't it? There's not much experience there. I think that's the route Chelsea are looking to go down now. But there's still maybe a, a couple short, aren't there? We are. Thiago Silva single-handedly bringing the average age of this uh, Chelsea squad up. Uh, 39 years old and still going strong. Scored a goal. Older than me. Uh, rare. <laughs> you don't look any day older than 25, Dan. I do um, <laughs> But yeah, Thiago Silva is uh, one of the few experienced bodies in the Chelsea side. And you're right to point out the age of this Chelsea squad. It's very, very young. You look at the players that Chelsea are bringing in. You look at the players that Chelsea let go. It's a clear direction that this Chelsea squad is going in. Um, but as Alan Hansen once said you don't win anything with kids so if Chelsea do want to compete uh, at the higher end of the Premier League table again we probably do need to bring in a little bit more experience and hopefully keep hold of some players that have been linked away uh, because it's all well and good having young players that are youthful that are vibrant that are unscarred by previous failures but when it gets to the deepest darkest parts of the Premier League season the clocks change the skies are darker earlier you need experience to pull you through those games and I think that Chelsea, that's probably where they're lacking a little bit. So hopefully between now and the end of the close of the window, we can bring in a few more experienced players. Kai Saido is the one, isn't he? I think he really elevates that midfield. If he comes in, he's, he's a young player himself, but he's obviously played a season and a half now in the in the Premier League, pretty much. £100 million Brighton want for him. We know that if Chelsea want him, They'll probably have to pay that £100 million because Brighton don't really do much negotiating with transfers. But if you can get him in, he's a real high-level player. And if you put him next to Enzo Fernandez, even though they're both young, I think them two are sixes. That's the making of a, of a real good partnership for probably a decade, the, ne- the next decade there, I would say. Like I say, I really think that will elevate Chelsea's business this summer to being right up there. I agree. Um, that double pivot, and I know that I've been getting a lot of flack online for saying that Caicedo will unlock Enzo, but he's the key to it, really. We know how good Enzo is, but he's not that good going the other way. He wants to be going forward. And Caicedo, we've seen it at Brighton, despite the fact he's only had one full Premier League season, um, he's a player that can bring the best out of Enzo Fernandez, who is also another player we spent a lot of money on. It's weird though, Chelsea and Brighton, it seems to be like a cold war going on, despite the fact that we've negotiated um, over a number of deals. If you think about Billy Gilmore going to Brighton, us getting Kukurea, obviously we sent Levi Colwell out there on loan, but it seems like it's a little bit hostile in terms of the Lamp- negotiations. Lamp-tier. It was Lampty Chelsea as well. It was, yeah, wasn't it? Lamp- yeah. Lampty as well. So we've done a lot of business to Brighton, but they don't seem to want to budge on this um, on this Caicedo deal. Obviously, reports yesterday suggested that Chelsea are in for Robert Sanchez in goal, but I don't see any movement on Caicedo, so it'll be interesting to see how that transfer unfolds. Um, but Caicedo is a player that we need. If you look at the midfield options for Chelsea, it's very, very light. Obviously, mm-hmm. we've talked about Enzo Fernandez already. We've got Chukwemeka in there, Conor Gallagher, who was himself linked to a move away from Chelsea. Um, and there's a few young players that brought in Andre Santos to, to name one of them. Um, Chelsea needs some experience and some bodies. He does look good. He looked very good in pre-season, but we need a little bit more in there. I think we'll be threadbare. And Potts has made the clearest one press conferences. He's not he's not shy of his words. He'll make it clear to the board and to the people that pay his wages that he needs bodies to do his job properly. And so hopefully between now and the end of the window, we can bring in ideally Caicedo. If not Caicedo, we, we target other players in that position um, because we are probably one or two or maybe even three bodies short across the squad in terms of having the complete squad for this upcoming season which of the signings so far has maybe not impressed you most but which is the is the sign that you're most excited to watch who's who've you got the high hopes for out of the players that have come through the door 
I'm on this Nicholas Jackson hype train. Um, he scored yeah. a few goals in preseason, some impressive assists as well. Showed some flashes of brilliance. And Chelsea have been crying out for a striker. See that Tammy Abraham shirt in the background there, Olivier Giroud as well. Two of the, like in terms of recent years, post Diego Costa, two strikers that have done very, very well for Chelsea were both in the Chelsea Champions League winning squad. But Chelsea have struggled to score goals. That was the problem last season for Chelsea, scoring goals. And so Nicholas Jackson, with his, his flashes of brilliance in pre-season and his ability to put the ball in the back of the net, has definitely excited a few Chelsea fans. Uh, Nkunku was a deal that we knew had was basically done for a while. He scored a few goals in pre-season as well. Um, scored a few tap-ins as well. I like that. As a, as a football fan, I like when your strikers are scoring the simple goals because it's difficult positions to get in. So if the strikers can do that and they can put the ball in the back of the net, then it both well in terms of in terms of them converting chances um they're, they're more difficult chances so I've been, I've liked seeing Nicholas Jackson I've liked seeing Nkunku and in terms of backup options I really like Malo Gusto he's he's, gonna ask showed, you about he showed a lot he showed a lot and we know about how good Reese James is but also let's be honest we know how injury prone Reese James is Malo Gusto is a man that can play right back he can play a little bit further forward as a right winger if we play free at the back he can play right wing back as well and so he's a player that's really excited me and a player that bolsters our squad um, and I think that if given the opportunity, say James has to be rested or we, we load manage his minutes then Malo Gusto is a man that can slot right in Yeah I think that's a big thing because last season when James and Chilwell were out there wasn't really like for like to, to come in. Kukurea struggled at, at left back and Aspilicueta was having to play on the right hand side and you know you couldn't get any any more different, could you, in, in terms of in terms of wing backs there. So I think Gusto was a really important pickup in January. Obviously stayed where he was for, for last season, but he comes in and if James is now out, who you could argue is your most important player, if he's now out. There isn't really much of a drop down with Gusto, so I think that's a, that, that's a really important player to, to come back in, in into the squad. What about the, what about the manager then? Who who did you want first? It was was Poch the manager that you wanted when Chelsea were obviously looking for a new manager. It was difficult. I couldn't even see the wood from the trees at that point of the season when we'd gone from Thomas Tuchel at the beginning of the season to Graham Potter to Frank Lampard. I just wanted something different. Um, and Pochettino initially, it's quite hard to digest a former Spurs manager managing Chelsea. They normally Get well, so I've done it a lot the other way. Yeah, exactly. But he's a manager that uh, that is Premier League proven. Obviously, he didn't go the way he would have liked maybe at PSG, but he did win a league title eventually. And if you just look at him or you hear him talk in press conferences and interviews, he's decisive. I think that's what you need as a manager. Obviously, you're, you're a Villa fan. You know the difference between... It's, it's chalk and cheese. When you've got a manager, like in Villa's case, you had Steven Gerrard, and then a proper manager comes in, in Unai Emery, you know just how different it is. And I've seen that with Frank Lampard, obviously, but towards the back end of the season, you bring in Pochettino and the whole field, the whole essence, the way they talk, their authority, it's just completely different. And so despite the fact that I had some reservations of getting the former Spurs manager in through the door, as soon as he's come in, he's ingratiated himself with the fans. He's saying the right things. And he's also laying down the authority. I remember in his first press conference, he was talking about, um, he was asked about uh, the, the ownership group and Todd Bowley coming into the dressing room. And he was pretty clear, like, obviously, that's 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 OK, but it has come through me. Everything stops at my door. So I like the way he's talking. I like the way he's going about business. And fingers crossed we back him because it's been a long time since I've seen Chelsea manager last more than more than a season and a half. So hopefully Pochettino has a manager for the long run. I mean, it's, there's slight similarities in when he went into Spurs, really, isn't it? He managed to build a, a young team. I guess you'll be excited about that because he's coming into the youngest team in the league. But because he's been there and done that with Spurs, the level he elevated them to, albeit they didn't win anything, but I would say it was a successful period for Tottenham. And in fairness, since he's gone, they've not managed to replicate anywhere near what Pochettino did. I guess you'll you'll like that the fact that he's he's coming in with it with a young group of players that he can mould and shape because he he doesn't only mould just mould players as as footballers he moulds them as people as well and he'll be able to do that with Chelsea. Yeah, well, we've listened to Ben Chilwell talk about him already. He said he's, he's run for a brick wall for him and he's only been in charge since the beginning of July. It's only a month, um, and so yeah, he's a he's a type of manager that comes in there. He makes players better, and. 
obviously at Spurs, he was dealing with limited resources, a little bit different to Chelsea, there's money to spend, but there's a different direction that Chelsea are going in. It's a far cry from the window where Chelsea brought in Timo Werner and, and Kai Havertz and Hakim Ziyech and Thiago Silva, ready-made players to go and try and challenge for the biggest trophies and that culminated to win the Champions League. If you look at the uh, players Chelsea are targeting, no older than maybe 25 years old, they're talking about De Sassi in terms of the new mm. centre-back that we brought in, but no older than that and you rightly pointed out it's the youngest squad in the Premier League right now so Pochettino is the right man for the job the MO when he left Southampton to join Spurs was finishing the top four every single season and challenge for trophies he didn't win trophies but he finished in the top four every season and he was challenging for trophies they were in the, F- uh, they were in the Champions League final in 2019 so it's a uh, it's a similar MO that he's got at Chelsea obviously the job's a little bit more difficult because the, the challenge for the top not just top four but top six places are now very very competitive with the with the advances of Newcastle because of the millions that they've got to spend now obviously your boys Villa are in and amongst it Brighton are a great team as well and Poch has outlaid it himself he said that it's a it's a top 20 the Premier League's competitive there's no easy games so it's going to be tough for Chelsea to achieve um, the heights of previous seasons. But I definitely think Poch is the man for the job. Is there any areas that, that concern you? So we talked about midfield, obviously. Is, is goalkeeper an area that, that concerns you? Or do you actually think that Kepa now knows he's number one because Mendy's gone? I, I sometimes think Kepa's not been a successful signing, but I think having the two of them there, I don't think he did either of them any favours because I think neither of them really knew where they stood. Because Kepa is now the undisputed number one, do you think that would would help his game or would you like to see a new goalkeeper come in? Well, it looks like we're going to upset that apple cart because Robert Sanchez is in talks with Chelsea. so but He won't be maybe- number one, will he? I don't know, you know. I don't know. I know that it kind of it was, it was a fall from grace for him at Brighton and he was replaced by 32-year-old Jason Steele. But I think that's just a strictly playing decision. De Zerbi wants a, a goalkeeper that can play with his feet to the extent of inviting pressure from the opposition so they can spring traps and spring on the break and spring on the counter-attack. And that's a very specific way that De Zerbi wants his Brighton goalkeeper to play. I, I, when I've seen Robert Sanchez, I know that a few Brighton fans weren't in love with the way he plays, but I don't see there being much difference between him and Kepa. And as a Chelsea fan who's seen Kepa up close and personal, I know he had a great game last season against you boys at your place. Oh, I remember the, he... The, the one made... good game he's had, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Had World class that game. game he was. Yeah, it was, it was silly. There are questions to be answered with Kepa. Obviously, he came in for a lot of money, a world record fee for a goalkeeper. He hasn't really lived up to the billing. He's not comfortable with his feet. And if you look at the way Kepa plays in terms of when we play the ball back to him, he takes a step back. It's not a step forward. And that, that invites pressure. You're, you're automatically a yard or two deeper as a result of the style of play because he's not absolutely comfortable with the ball at his feet. Sanchez is a little bit more comfortable. And I think Poch is maybe looking at an option to, to have these two via out. Um, but long term, I don't see Kepa being Chelsea's number one. And until you solve that issue, can you really challenge at the top end of the table? When's the last time you see a, you see an English team win the Premier League or win the Champions League without a keeper playing at their absolute top? Um, it doesn't really happen. So I am tempering my expectations with Chelsea because of reasons like this, because we haven't got the top players in every position. And goalkeeper is just one of these issues that needs to be addressed because, for my money, Kepp is just not good enough to be Chelsea number one keeper. What about Levi Cole? Well, I watched a lot of him last season. Obviously, for Brighton was a big part of their success. I've watched him in England in the 21s in the summer as well and was, was really impressed with him. Do you think he comes in and he's, he's number one centre-half? Yeah, Levi Cole is, uh, is a player that's impressed. He's, been, he's a player that's been on everybody's lips for this summer especially with the success of England under 21s, the European Championship. And he was a stalwart in that team, a team that didn't concede any goals in that competition. Um, And at just 19 years old, if you listen to the way that people talk about him, listen to the way that Pochettino talks about him, um, he said he can go on to be one of the great England centre-backs. And I see that as well. He passes the eye test. Obviously, he was great for Brighton. He overcame injury and was was a big part of that Brighton side that qualified for European football for the first time in their history. And he's, I don't use the words because it seems like I'm going to curse him, but he's a Rolls Royce of a centre-back. Um, and I just love the idea of him learning off of Thiago Silva. He's left-footed, Thiago Silva's right-footed. They can play together. Um, and he's great on the ball as well. There's no wonder that the top teams in the country are sniffing around him. And there's no wonder that Chelsea are trying to sign him up to a long-term deal. Um, he is a, a player beyond his years. He's a player that is going to play at the very highest level 
all I can hope is that that le- that is at Chelsea because he's a homegrown player. And after this this summer, where we've let go of Mason Mount, who we, a lot of play a lot of fans saw as our future captain. Uh, we've let go of Ruben Loftus Cheek, who was probably the original Cobham Cub like hope for all fans. It's important to keep hold of the players that come from your academy. So Levi Colwell was one of those, and he's a player that if we handle the situation correctly, could be a Chelsea player for the next 10, 15 years and hopefully eventually go on to captain the club and win multiple trophies at Chelsea. Is there anyone you've you've lost that you would have rather stayed? Yeah, I presume maybe Mason Mount. Is there any, any of the others that have gone as well that you would have preferred stay at Chelsea? Mason Mount's the one that hurts the most just because of everything that goes into it. He was, he's the golden boy. If you, I've said it so many times, but you look at, team like Arsenal with Bukayo Saka or you look at Liverpool with Trent Alexander-Arnold Manchester United with Marcus Rashford Phil Foden the Man City these players that come from your academy they mean a lot more fans live vicariously through them you've seen them you've seen the pictures of them in the academy when they were seven eight nine years old um, and letting the player like that go to rival it for me it's a signifier um, obviously I've told you about how hopeful I am for this season but the Mason Mount situation when it was occurring at the beginning of the summer it reminded me of when Chelsea signed Ashley Cole from Arsenal in 2006 um, Arsenal were going in a certain direction mm-hmm. um, and Chelsea were going in a certain direction Chelsea were trying to challenge for the biggest honours in England in the world where Arsenal were in a rebuilding phase and let go of a future captain to a rival that's what Chelsea did in essence when they let Mason Mount go to Manchester United because in theory, Chelsea may not should be competing for the same honours. So what does it tell your fan base? What does it tell you as a fan if you're letting a player like Mason Mount go to one of your rivals you haven't been able to resolve that situation? It hurts. Um, but hopefully we can we can mitigate that situation. Hopefully the replacements we bring in can mean that we don't miss what Mason Mount brings to Chelsea. But if you're asking me what transfer in terms of outgoings hurt the most, Mason Mount leaving is just a killer. Look, it was a difficult season last year for, for Chelsea. I can laugh and joke with you uh, about finishing 12th. But, you know, this time last year, that was unthinkable. But I do think it, it's hard to come back when you, you know, this time last year, your your midfield options were Kante, Kovacic, Jorginho, Mason Mount. None of them are there anymore. Even throw Loftus-Cheek in there as well. You know, none of those players are there anymore. So you're ha- then having to integrate a completely new core into, into the middle of your team. And I think that that's really, really difficult. But I guess... No, you won't be a positive because you want to be in Europe, but not having that that Thursday, Sunday or, or Champions League football this season in particular, when it really is a young side, that may help Chelsea. Definitely, that will help Chelsea. And it's, when you're reading off those names in terms of Kovacic. A lot of players. Yeah, but like Jorginho, Kante, Mount. Apart from Kante, the others have gone to top Premier League clubs. We've lost quality. We've lost quality in that area and and it's difficult when you lose players in midfield because that's your engine room. That's not an area of the field you want to be chopping and changing. You want to be pretty settled in that. And the fact that we've lost those players um, to some of our rivals, it kind of tells you where Chelsea you are. It's a rebuild right now. Um, and so we'll see how it we see how it plays out, really. Hopefully we can get this Caicedo deal over the line. But you do look... In envy at clubs like Man City, you've got midfielders in abundance. When you look at Chelsea, really, obviously, you know Carney Chukwuneka very well. He's mm. a player that has been exciting in pre-season. He looked good uh, last time out for Chelsea when he played against Fulham. Uh, we've got Enzo Fernandez in there as well. We've got Conor Gallagher, Andre Santos. Um, it's not enough. It's not enough. And if you want to be competing for the the highest honours, you want to be finishing the top six, top four, you've got to have a settled midfield and a midfield that you can rely on and sometimes rotate. Um, you're right in terms of the lack of European football will probably play into our favour, but we do need to get more experienced bodies in the midfield if you want to be challenging for what we want to challenge for next season. I mean, the good news for you, you said you don't like chop, chop and changing. You won't be able to chop and change because there isn't enough <laughs> players in that midfield area. So you won't have to worry about that for the new season. Now, obviously, I've been doing the Sky Transfer shows with you. And I said this morning that I think in Poch Chelsea, have got a top four manager. I understand what they're doing. I actually quite like what they're doing. But as it stands, yeah. I don't think that's a top six side. I just, I just, I just don't. Looking at it, I think there's, it's an awful lot of potential at the moment, an awful lot of unknown. Where where would you be happy with finishing this season? What what's your ambition for Chelsea this season? It feels hard to say that uh, as a Chelsea fan, a side who spent more money than anybody over the last year and a half, two years, for me to say I'm fin- I'm happy finishing fifth or sixth. 
but that's where I expect us to finish. Fifth or sixth, playing decent football, scoring some goals. That's what fans of Stanford Bridge want to see. Last year was tough. Bored. It's, it's it's okay if you're scoring loads of goals, but you can see loads of goals. Um, a la Klopp side when he first came in 15 16, where they were scoring those goals, really exciting. But it the problem was defensively, and eventually they reject that with, with Allison and Van Dyke. With Chelsea, it was boring football and poor results. So, what I want to see this upcoming season is some good football, people can put the ball in the back of the net, and ultimately, I think we're going to finish up fifth, sixth in the Premier League. Um, I know that you feel Villa are going to have a good season and Villa are going to finish We're going to, arrange, we're going to arrange a bet after the show, aren't we? We're going to, we're we, going to, going to we, get that sorted out. We need to, because I, I, despite the fact that there are teams on the up and up there, there are upcoming teams. I, I like the business that Villa have done. I like the look of Villa under, under Unai Emery. I think that Chelsea will have enough to finish ahead of some of those pretenders and, and hopefully finish fifth or sixth and qualify for Europa League football next season. Well, fifth, I think, might even get you Champions League football, actually. Well, yeah. The, because of the new format. Exactly. So with, with the coefficient, I'm not too sure how that will work out. But if, if you finish fifth and you, you qualify for the Champions League, I will take that right now. And obviously, as a Chelsea fan, we've been spoiled in recent years. The, the era that I started supporting Chelsea was the late 90s under Viali, where Chelsea won on cup runs. It seemed, it seemed like every single season, whether it's the League Cup or the Cup Winners Cup or the FA Cup, I want to see us go in a cup run. I'm scarred by the three FA Cup finals that we've lost in the row. We need to get to Wembley and actually win a game. Um, and so I'd like to see Chelsea go on a cup run as well. And maybe put that myth to bed that Pochettino can't win a trophy in England because he's a top manager. I think it's circumstantial what happened at, um, at Spurs in terms of him not winning the trophy. It was one of the best teams in the country over a three or four year period. And so if I see Chelsea go on a nice cup run, a little trip to Wembley in the summer, I'll definitely be happy about that. I mean, you've had a decent life being a Chelsea fan, Quaker. I think you've <laughs> won every single trophy that you could have possibly won in the time since you've supported the club. So I'm not going to feel too sorry for you <laughs> after, after you said the last time, because I think you have seen Chelsea lift absolutely everything. And I'm not in a position to judge about teams winning trophies because my team hasn't won anything since 1996. Just to finish then, you have to pick one player, key man for Chelsea this season. Who would you pick? It has to be Enzo Fernandez. Can I get two? Can I get two? No, no, that you can have one. The question, the <laughs> okay. question was what? <laughs> who, who was second? Who was second? Okay, so first Enzo Fernandez. I'll explain why. He is... There's a reason why Chelsea paid the 100 plus million for Enzo Fernandez. Obviously, World Cup tax, we understand that Benfica were in a strong position and Chelsea had to pay the money for a player Chelsea that they felt... as well. Chelsea tax as well. And that's what Brighton are, are doing to us right now with Caicedo. But when I saw him last season, uh, there was points where it was brilliant. There was points where you look, you're look, you looking at it and you're like, this is a top player. This can be a top player. We need to surround him with talent and ask him to do a little bit less than he's doing right now. Um, and we need, to, we need to help him out. We need to bring in a player that can maybe do the defensive work. But if we do get that player in, I think Enzo Fernandez will be a key man for Chelsea next season. Um, I've seen in preseason already some of the through balls, some of the crossfield passes. He's just a midfielder that's got so much ability and he's a, he's a blessing to watch. Um, second place for me in Kunku. I've, I've talked about Nicholas Jackson in terms of a player that I've been excited um, about in terms of, of signings. But Chelsea need a forward player to pop. Chelsea need a forward player to, to contribute 12, 15, even 18 to 20 Premier League goals. Haven't had that since Tammy's first season in Chelsea's first team. Um, I think it was 19, 20 season. Haven't had a, a 20 goal a season in terms of Premier League goal striker since Diego Costa in 2017, the last time that Chelsea won the Premier League. I want to see a Chelsea forward score a lot of goals. Um, and when you've got that, you've got a chance. When you've got somebody who can put the ball in the back of the net, despite problems elsewhere, you've got a chance. You can look at what Poch did. Um, at Spurs, obviously, it's predicated on a strong foundation, a strong base in terms of defence and midfield. But ultimately, if Harry Kane wasn't putting the ball in the back of the net, Spurs wouldn't have got to where they got to. Chelsea needs somebody to score goals. And if we're going to be successful, I think Nkunku's going to have to, uh, to chip in with quite a few goals. So Enzo Fernandez number one for me, Nkunku number 1.5 slash 2. 
Yeah, I mean, if you want him to be successful, do not give him the number nine shirt because anyone who wears that number nine shirt for Chelsea seems seems to struggle. I think you you know what you say about Enzo is true, and also for the likes of him and Mudrick, you know, if you put him them into that team last season, it's not fair to judge them because Chelsea were a basket case club. In, well, for most, of, I was going to say the second half of the season, but actually for, for most of the season, and if you you know you put any young player into into that team, however good they are, they're going to struggle. So hopefully this year will be a bit more positive for the big money signings that you made in January as well, because that will help. Kwaku, it's always a pleasure to converse with you. Thanks ever so much for joining me today. As I say, absolute pleasure to talk to you. And good luck to Chelsea next season, but not too much luck because I want to win our bet. (laughs) Thank you, mate.